So, a traditional Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the Holy Watermelon Podcast. My name is Katie. And I'm Preston. And today we are going to be talking about the beginning of modern religion. Well, do we want to talk about the beginning of modern religion? No, nope. see, now it's weird. I'm like, sure do, Preston. Um, yeah, I guess let's talk about how modern religion started. I, you got to take the lead on this. I'm okay. our resident scholar. So I read a book for, well, actually, I pretended to read a book for one of my classes. <laughs> <laughs> I read the the introduction, which was the book for one of my theology courses called Thinking About God. Uh, it was written by Karen Armstrong, I'm pretty sure. Oh, she's written a few good books. She's written I read a lot. Her Islam book's very good, which will... A lot of people really like her, including the professor for that class. And the intro for this book, that I can't remember the name of off the top of my head right now, I'll talked that. about the idea that before we had all of these various religions that focused on multiple gods, before there was this idea of magic... There was this sky god that everybody recognized as being the ultimate god, but nobody worshipped him. They just recognized that he is a creator, he's the sky god, and that's the deal. And they kind of, you know, would occasionally mention him when it was important. Like if something was happening in the skies, it'd be like, yep, that's the dude. Is it A History of God by Karen Armstrong? Bet you it is. Perfect. <laughs> we writes a lot of great books on religion so yeah you'll hear her mentioned multiple times there's also one called in the beginning that sounds cool that's like the name of our episode maybe <laughs> and oh no that's a christian one so it's definitely a history of god i think it was a history of god that does sound right so in a history of god she talks about this idea of and it's just a theory because there's no historical concrete evidence that it's true that all people everywhere, or at least an awful lot of them, believed in this sky god without actually worshipping him, which is so kind nothing of interesting. Ceremonial. Nothing ceremonial at all. They just knew he was there. Definitely recognized that he was a part of their lives. And then later, as the need came up to explain the universe around them, they came up with other gods, which is, I don't know, a familiar cop-out, like the Tooth Fairy? <laughs> Course, yeah, it's much like Santa Claus. How do I get my kids to behave? Right. Santa Which works laughing. for December. And for like, I don't know, <laughs> from the ages of three to ten, like seven years. Yeah. And then right. people eventually figure out Santa's that Santa's not, not real. real. But Santa is real. <laughs> he just died 2,000 years ago. Well, almost 2,000 years ago. <laughs> That's a difference. Right? <laughs> we can focus on Christmas later. <laughs> um, now, another cop out for mm -hmm. school is the book The Golden Bough, which I haven't read. I've heard of it. I've and never maybe read it you either. should have read it for this maybe. podcast. <laughs> but it talks about, and I remember, oh, I packed it. We're moving, but I packed it. Um, I remember when I took my introductory religious course, it talks about how civilization has moved from magic to religion and it was supposed to move from religion to science and maybe it still will but we're in this sort of limbo where people still believe in both but nobody nobody air quotes f believes in magic anymore we don't use it to explain the universe right which is a thing i find really interesting that you know if we look at primitive cultures primitive air quotes <laughs> that like you know, on underexplored Africa or underexplored South America, you have people who are still very much into witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And anthropologists have assumed for centuries that, well, obviously, because they're not as developed as we are, they represent our history. So we were all like that, which makes some sense, but it's also really hard to prove. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it does make for very helpful examination of potential human development and helps us look at where we probably came from and where we ought to be going relative to that. But 
it's super weird that mostly 60s, 70s, that, that big hippie countercultural movement, saw a huge resurgence in magic. Wiccans, as we know them today, were almost completely non-existent in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And yet magic is coming back too for some reason. It may be because religion refuses to die. That's so interesting. really hard to say. It could just be because people like pissing off their religious parents. And then that tradition continues on. There's a lot of guesses. And the people who really started the movement aren't really open to telling us why and how. <laughs> Fair. I mean, some of the more modern examples of religion might be a good analysis of how religions come about. But I also find some of them odd in that, I mean, we were talking about Scientology before we pressed record, but um, L. Ron Hubbard was a science fiction author. So it, I can't extrapolate how someone believes what a 1950s science fiction author, that this is some religion or explanation of the universe. And I even struggle with, you know, Mormonism in that we had record keeping in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Right. So that the, how, it's something that could potentially be provable, but there is no proof. Yeah. Yeah. For... I don't really know where I'm going with that point. <laughs> right. But it, you know, things that have stuck in recent centuries, um, maybe a good place to look at how we as a civilization have become mm -hmm. religious over time. Yeah. I think as it relates to um, the whole magic, religion, science thing, one of the biggest things and this might also explain the resurgence of wicca and other witchcraft forms is the idea of authority in science you have authorities people who have done lots of testing who can prove to you this is my claim and this is why you should believe it because water does boil at 100 and it, degrees celsius and it's peer -reviewed. <laughs> yeah and and so when you've proven yourself to a bunch of people who are also knowledgeable and understanding that gives you a sense of authority a very real authority as, as far as epistemolo epistemological authority is the word, which is just, uh, I have authority because I know a thing okay. rather than okay. I have authority because I stab your friends several times with a sword. Right. As in previous <laughs> yeah. um, centuries. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, that same sort of epistemological authority is claimed by religious leaders and historically, let's look at uh, Muhammad, for example. He killed an awful lot of people to show his authority over them and then taught them, having um, established his authority and then establishing his doctrine after. Mm -hmm. And there's there's loads more examples than just Muhammad, but he's I mean, a I really... Think immediately the Crusades, right? We yeah. Killed a bunch of people and then converted them. Right. Actually, that's even more recent, so I like it a little bit better. <laughs> um, so you've got that sort of religious authority that often came at the point of a sword, but also occasionally, in the example of Jesus, did not come by the point of a sword, but he just let people know, hey, this is a thing. And the stories are that he healed people and established his authority that way. People were super interested in him because of the cool things he did instead of the deadly things he did. Mm -hmm. And then he established his doctrine, which is a little closer to the preferable science that we like. And then magic. The authority isn't the same sort of thing that we have with religion and science. You've got people who can accomplish things. And then as they continually accomplish things, they get revered as sages or as shamans or priests or whatever or often just elders and people go to them because they can accomplish things and because they know things which is usually a lot more respected than authority won by the sword <laughs> i mean it's probably more long lasting yeah right it's you know keeping your staff happy right <laughs> good management right it's just good if you're a boss keep your staff happy don't bully them yeah so it's a system of organization. Absolutely. All, whatever your religion is, and like we say magic's not religion and science isn't religion. They are, 
<laughs> uh, religion that's our next episode everyone. is nearly impossible to define in a way that scholars can all universally agree but we're gonna try yeah <laughs> we're gonna try and hopefully that'll work out um but religion in its most base etymological meaning is a way of organizing things and binding people together and whether that's i mean and it could be a good thing it can be a bad thing <laughs> but also like and we'll get into this next episode uh -huh. but science is a way to organize the Absolutely. world and i'm sure i'm not magical we'll find a wiccan one day magic is the way to organize Absolutely. Um, the world and probably even more on a personal level but like your thoughts and how your life is supposed to go and i'm sure we'll get into topics on things like marriage and children and sex but even you know it sort of dictates that this is the way that makes sense to live your life and and then the community and then the world exactly so the way that that progression model works is that we're finding better more reasonable ways to organize the world because it turns out as far as we can observe now magic isn't reliable <laughs> um the the old explanation for that is that there's so many intricate details performing a spell for example that you just can't do it reliably mm -hmm. when the other half of the argument is magic is nonsense because it straight up doesn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then religion, I mean, for example, the idea that God lives in the skies, mm -hmm. we have concretely proven that's not the case. Otherwise we'd have God all over the front of our windscreens on our airplanes. Mm -hmm. That'd be a huge problem. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Like yeah. Like there's there's loads of there's no one in the clouds. Right. There's loads Birds. of specific details that are super easy to disprove mm -hmm. when you look at a religion, mm -hmm. depending on what religion it is. Some of them have make no specific claims at all, which makes you wonder why they're making any sort of claims at all. <laughs> and then others make loads of very specific claims that just don't hold up even internally when you look at the rest of the religion they've mm -hmm. built. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, I can't remember the name of the lady. She was Jesus of the Shakers. I know who you're talking about. Uh, she said that she was Jesus reborn. And she taught from the Bible at least a little bit. But the Bible does explicitly say that Jesus will come back in the exact same way that he left. And late. Said that she was Jesus, even though she denied that she came into the world the same way Jesus left, which was up into the clouds. Mary Dyer was born of a woman in the typical expected fashion. <laughs> Head first, probably. <laughs> and so there's already, at the very outset of all of her claims, a serious internal consistency issue. <laughs> I feel like there's going to have to be an episode on people claiming to be jesus oh there are so many i watched a wild documentary last it was wild i it was wild well we'll do an episode on it but that's all i can say i couldn't mind blow um back onto our main track right magic science religion religion science magic religion science there's this ridiculous norm in the united states and it's nowhere else in the world just in the United States and those cultures heavily influenced by them. So Alberta, for example, <laughs> a, lo a lot of Canada, but not all of Canada. We're start getting our first heat mail. There's a, a religious objection to all science. Mm -hmm. Most flat earthers are Christians. I don't know why, but most flat earthers are Christians and most American Christians, especially the evangelicals, will deny almost anything that is published in a medical journal, <laughs> even if it's peer-reviewed and proven. Um, I think this mostly starts from the idea of evolution has to disprove theology, mm -hmm. which, I mean, even Vatican, the Pope has said that, yeah, evolution could totally be the reality the Bible doesn't say how God created what lives on the earth. He just says that he did. Yeah. And to be real, that part of the Bible is meant explicitly for a temple, short history of the world, understand where your place is in the world. 
God is your creator and everything else. So it's all poetical, ritualistic narrative anyway. Um, and, well, <laughs> th- well, and to jump in, the super old movie on the Scopes Monkey Trial. No idea. I don't remember what it's called. Inherit the Wind? Inherit the Wind? <laughs> Can I Google that real quick? Can I Google that real quick? <laughs> Inherit the Wind? We'll just rely on our trusty editor. <laughs> yes, it's uh, yes, it's on the Scopes Monkey Trial. I don't know if this was actually said in the Scopes Monkey Trial um, or if it was just dramatic for Inherit the Wind, but the lawyer debating in favor of teaching evolution in school says the Bible doesn't say how long the first day was. Right. Could have been 10 million years. Well, especially since in the narrative in Genesis, the sun isn't created yet. Mm-hmm. To, to say that a day has to be 24 hours when there is no visible sun to rule the night and the day is super weird. <laughs> yeah, so... Absolutely. It's it's poetic. It's again, it's a way to organize and answer questions people have without having the tools we have now to explain it. Yeah. But back to your point on evangelicals believing yeah. they will deny science at just like if you use the word science, it gets a whole bunch of people all worked up and their amygdala fires off that they're being threatened because they perceive a war between science and religion. And an awful lot of scientists believe that that war is absolutely validated Mm -hmm. because most of their experience with religious people is crazy Christians who deny science, (laughs) which is a problem. (laughs) Well, and uh, I mean, we're definitely seeing that now. Absolutely. Uh, We're recording this on in 2020. (laughs) Because I don't actually know when this is going to come out, so I don't want to date ourselves. But we're recording 2020 in the middle of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, and the U.S. has hundreds of thousands of cases. Um, There's more than 100,000 deaths. Yes. They have over 100,000 In just the United States. Um, And, I mean, obviously some of this is political and political policies. They don't have universal health care. But, you know, when you're being told to drink bleach... Um, that is definitely a, or not wear a mask or not social distance. That's definitely a science problem where people aren't listening to the experts. Yeah. And it's more Christians. And I'm, I'm just going to pick on Christians here. He's allowed to. He is. I, I am a Christian, but I am not one of those Christians who is anti-science. And I feel no guilt picking on the anti-science Christians. They need to realize that science is a body of knowledge as well as a method of proving that knowledge Mm -hmm. which means there's loads of things that science will never prove absolutely and there's loads of things that science will prove (laughs) i well i guess it's the problem comes from taking and and correct me as a religious person Mm -hmm. um but taking everything as literal truth that when it gets contradicted, now you can't pivot or else your entire world crumbles apart. Yeah. Um, there's there's loads of Christians. Um, so in from 2009 to 2011, I was a missionary, actively teaching full-time every day of the week. And no day job to support me. It was actually kind of nice to not have to worry about a job apart from teaching. I dealt with an awful lot of people who genuinely believed the Bible was written by God. Which, I mean... If you've opened the book, that becomes very obvious that that's not the case. (laughs) Um, Which actually is a segue into a cool topic for another day. Hoodoo, which is like voodoo, but Mm -hmm. not Catholic. I actually just heard this term recently. Hoodoo? Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard it before. And it was on the internet, so I was being mocked for getting, calling it um, like a geographical formation. And then she shared the (laughs) Wikipedia link to hoodoo. And I was like, whoa. Right? Yeah. Interesting. So... Um, to me, the most interesting magical um, groups are voodoo and hoodoo. Mm-hmm. And do you know the difference? I don't because I didn't you, read that Wikipedia okay. article. <laughs> so Wikipedia article is quite lengthy. It goes into loads of detail. Cliff's notes. Mm. Hoodoo is Protestant to voodoo's Catholic. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. But not not exactly like that. One didn't break off from the other. Okay. Voodoo They don't is, like each other. Voodoo is Catholic. Oh, voodoo okay. is comes primarily from Haiti, which comes from Africa, and exists because of Catholicism. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's the best example of what Catholicism is 
because it takes an existing system and melds it into a new theology. Okay. So the voodoo had all these gods that could do all these crazy things and help people out a lot. And then when they said, okay, now you're Catholic, they're like, okay, so we have all these saints who have an awful lot of similarities with these gods, which is exactly the way they did it in Rome. Not even the tiniest bit different. Mm -hmm. The saints have just been amalgamated into these gods. And so sometimes I'll keep an old name like Baron Samity. And sometimes, well, actually, that's not even a terribly ancient name. That's a French name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they'll, and sometimes they'll have a, a new name like St. Bridget, who is definitely an amalgama amalgamation with a previous Bridget. Kind of convenient that way. Names are the easiest way to amalgamate people, but sometimes they'll take aspects instead. And so you've got this multi-god saint voodoo mm -hmm. and they're really into dealing with the gods just like Christ just like catholics are way into dealing with saints mm -hmm. and we'll talk about what worship is a little bit later because there's no valid claim that the praying and dealing with saints is not worship mm -hmm. um hoodoo is directly derived from the the same sort of magic people dealing with protestants they don't have saints. Protestantism mm -hmm. is very anti-saint, and very. or at least anti the model of Catholic saints. Yes. That's not good grammar, but I said what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, these magical people who are hoodoo, they see the Bible that these Protestants wield, and they declare great authority by having the book, because you know they never read it. Just like the hoodoo, almost never read it. Just like any religious person. Right. Oh, they there are, said it. There are way too many Christians who have no idea what's in the Bible. I actually had a conversation two days ago with a lovely fella. I never actually met him, but he's a relative of a friend of mine. And we had a chat over Facebook, which is, by its very nature, Dangerous. very prone to explosion. Uh, we, he and I both did a great job of remaining civil. And then I ended the conversation when he said, there's nothing you can say that can change my mind. And I said, thanks for the conversation and goodbye, essentially. Uh, but he was 100% convinced that the early Christian church had no interest in communism. And then I pointed to him the exact spots in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, where God or the church mm. killed a family for not voluntarily being part of this communist system. They were told to sell their property. They did sell their property, but they kept a bunch of the money to themselves and only gave a little bit to the church. They were killed for it. So that is forced communism. Mm -hmm. And when I explained that to him, uh, he, he didn't like that at all. And I couldn't change his mind. It was very frustrating. But there's loads, loads of Christians who have no idea what's in the Bible. <laughs> well, and I mean, this is going to be probably a multi-part episode when we do tackle the Bible. But yeah. I, I mean, even if you have read the Bible, there's, I mean, dozens, if not hundreds of versions of the Bible, plus yes. your own personal interpretation. So, yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> well, we'll get there. There are hundreds of textual variants in Greek that we have more than a hundred translations in English of the I, Bible. Somebody, <laughs> I, I don't, I was... Somebody had it in their Instagram bio. They had, I don't remember what it was, but they had cited a, a Bible quote. And I was just curious what it was. So I just put it in and Googled it. And the website I found had every different version. So of, Bible Gateway is a great tool. That's probably that's exactly probably what it was. <laughs> and I just couldn't believe the variations mm -hmm. from passage to passage, like totally different meanings. So, yeah. So um, the, the hoodoo like many Christians, use the Bible just as a, a totem or a talisman. It's, it's a beating stick as much as it's a thing to be read. Um, <laughs> you, you can go into coastal United States along, along the east, and you'll find houses where there's Bible pages pasted behind the wallpaper at, for its protective powers. I'm remembering that comedian we saw that was beating the globe <laughs> with a Bible to flatten it. 
<laughs> so, for some reason, just I, I don't, the the use of talismans and totems is incredibly ancient. That um, that we've found loads of passages of scripture written on a piece of paper with nail stuck through it and worn around the neck or in a pocket or thrown into a well as curses or protections to help people. And so hoodoo and voodoo are, for that reason, my favorite kind of magic community type thing because they illustrate that really well, but also illustrate in a slightly alien way the very natures of Catholicism and Protestantism. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's, that's nice. more or less what I remember from there. The faith instinct. You want to talk about I that? I do want to talk about the faith instinct because I still don't know if I agree with you. Sure, um, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> so I read a book called The Faith Instinct, How Religion Evolved and Why It Endures. So it was basically in the book saying that we are religious because of evolution. So just like we have two eyes and two hands and people average between five and six feet tall, it's all evolutionary. And some of it was very interesting and some of it I disagreed with. The Let's maybe start on the parts that I, <laughs> I could wrap my head around sure. and then we'll get into our fight. No, I'm sure. We won't fight. <laughs> um, it, it talked about how it was used as a system of organization, especially for nomadic peoples. Like, this is tens of thousands of years ago. Like, this is pre-Christian, pre-Roman, um, the sky daddy you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you organize a society to behave a certain way for, for the betterment and survival of all? The book compared religion to language, which I disagreed with and feel free to jump in at any time <laughs> but it said he sort of said in the book that uh even if no one taught you how to speak if your mom didn't sit down and go mama you would learn how to speak eventually and that religion was the same that if no one sat down and taught you religion you'd be religious anyway which i disagree with because i wasn't sat down and taught religion and i'm not religious i disagree with both of those okay two well, points, well we'll get there but um, <laughs> And I am reminded um, Ricky Gervais, the actor, mm -hmm. who's I relate to him because he's he's like me in that he is an atheist, but he will protect. He's happy to protect your right to be religious. Mm -hmm. um, but he has said that like if kids weren't taught anything until eighteen, we'd have a way fewer religious people running around. Probably. But I see you're wanting to say something, so let's jump in. What was where was I was talking about speech and how that that is evolutionary but if someone doesn't sit down and teach religion you probably obviously there are exceptions to the rule i'm sitting with one um mm -hmm. but you probably won't be religious see my definition of religion that i mentioned earlier okay let's, let's <laughs> keep it in terms of organized mainstream religion if nobody teaches you to worship worship a specific god you're not going to start doing it out of nowhere mm -hmm. that doesn't that doesn't make sense it doesn't logically follow the, you have to have somebody tell you that this individual is worth worshipping. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder when that being doesn't exist. So somebody's going to have to tell you. <laughs> now, if, you know, Odin all of a sudden is real and isn't just a mortal man, but a god, and he comes to you and displays his power, you're probably going to start worshipping him. So there is that. Absolutely. You do need to be taught religion to be part of that religion. Mm -hmm. But as far as the whole authoritative leadership of an organized group, I mean, we straight up can't survive without it. So well, and evolutionarily speaking, we absolutely do need to be religious in that aspect. Yes. And, but that can come <laughs> as simple as your mom or dad's the boss, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, that's usually the deal. <laughs> yeah, that's usually how we learn it. And, and if your mom and dad's boss happens to be God, then yeah, cool. But if you're not, then... I I think it's a lot harder to fall into organized religion. And I guess, we'll, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I, I know there's plenty of exceptions to that rule. Well, I'm sure there'll be an episode on cults where perfectly normal people get pulled into something. But yeah, I think, you know, if you're not taught that, you know, there's someone watching your move and things that 
I personally roll my eyes at that, you know, this person, this guy daddy cares that you're having sex before you sign a piece of paper, um, <laughs> then you probably won't care. Yeah. Right? And then it's on our outline. And we, I know we disagree on this. The book also said that our set of morals come from religion. And I can see this in a very, like, long-term scope, you know, the 10, you know, prehistoric, that, you know, you steal my corn from me and then I die and now I don't like you because my kids are dead because they didn't have enough to eat. Like, I can get that from a moral standpoint, but I don't necessarily see how uh, more modern religions in the last 2,000 years affect our morals because there's some really terrible stuff in all of the books. Like, don't... Mm -hmm. I'm not picking favorites here yeah <laughs> but that that teaches morals like yeah there's a lot of good stuff but there's a lot of bad stuff mm -hmm. and i just don't see how like i don't see how that is something that we've been able to muddle through without like i said long term oh you killed my husband i'm sad <laughs> like now i like that's where your morals come from but you know it's in the early books of the bible you can throw in your citation because I don't know about where the girls get their dad drunk and rape him. Yep. Like, I almost <laughs> threw up reading that one. I was like, well, this is so gross. So how do you separate that from, you know, don't covet and don't Why kill? should we separate it from? That, mean, that story is not told as a good example of what people can and should be. That, it's, it's meant to be a horror story. Okay, good. <laughs> Because there's really not a lot of context around it. No, it's 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 really weak in the context area. Yes, their then, lot is and his wife and his daughters leave a town while it's being rained on by hellfire, and they happen to survive except for the wife who turns into a pillar of salt, which obviously chemically makes no sense oh. at all. <laughs> and so it, the wife dies. It could be some narrative tool to describe something else who knows the wife dies lot and his two daughters whose names i can't remember off the top of my head go hide in a cave and think they're the last people on earth and there is no part of the torah that says it's okay for a man to sleep with his daughters it is spe specifically and explicitly forbidden the girls do it anyway because they're dumb and think that they need to repopulate <laughs> the earth with their very uh, limited gene pool because uh, apparently it worked twice before. Now we're all mouth breathers. <laughs> so it's it's a horror story that happens to be scripture. <laughs> but yeah, no, I've, I've heard a lot of people think that that's actually meant to be a good a role model story, which... I mean, I definitely don't <laughs> think it's that, but, but I guess my is, you know, my... There's not a lot of context. No. Right? They don't say, this is bad, you shouldn't do it. They just say, these girls get their dad drunk and well, rape him. But um, later on in the story, Lot does wake up and say, what the hell are you doing? This is a terribly sinful thing. Why have you done this to me? So there's, there's that little bit of helpful context that is not strong enough <laughs> well yeah and then i mean if you think thou shalt not kill there's a ton of killing in the bible Loads. right so like i said i can see long term prehistoric for the survival of people you know yeah don't kill people don't rape people it fucks them up and makes them think like, no basket cases <laughs> in almost every case right <laughs> um you know which which I mean, this is terrible. This is really just boiling it down to its roots, but makes a less productive, less healthy society. Which, Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, well, again, over the course of time, I can see how it shapes our morals, but I don't think because I am not a Christian, I am immoral. Right. And I also didn't have my Christian friends tell me, like, Katie, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't lie. Like, that was fucking Sesame Street. Right. But if you were to compare the Christian standard to, say, the Viking standard, it's okay, even encouraged, to go out and rape and plunder and take what you want from other people okay. because they're other. Well, and they're but they're <laughs> religious people. So yeah. you yeah. know, do we so do we get our morals? From your, religion? your morality, <laughs> your morality is informed by your worship. Mm -hmm. Entirely. Now, worship used in the broad sense of things that you deem of worth. Mm -hmm. Things that you deem of value. You've got people who worship themselves. So 
literally, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's not me, it doesn't matter. Right. I will take what I want. That's my morality. Then you've got people who are very community focused. If it doesn't help my community, it is evil. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot more palatable. But you swing that just a tiny little bit over towards Nazism. If it doesn't help my Aryan community. My people. (laughs) Then it's evil. And that's how you get very dangerous concentration camps. and. <laughs> but, but, but again, back to religion mm-hmm. and in the modern context, yeah. you have Christians that are very moral. Mm-hmm. And, and Christians that aren't. And Christians that can get West <laughs> Baptist Church and one in seven Catholic priests. So, yeah. yeah, so what you worship, they're all worshiping the same thing. Or at least say they are. Um, and they all have vastly different ideas of what their morals are. And again, as someone who's an atheist who didn't go through church, I know it's not okay (laughs) to picket soldiers' funerals. I know it's not okay to touch altar boys inappropriately. Mm -hmm. I would never be in a situation near an altar boy (laughs) as an atheist. But, um, (laughs) like, I know these things are wrong, and these are people who are leaders in their community, and they're doing it. So, Most of our Western standard morality which is very different from the Greek morality that we like to pretend we model ourselves after. Like Socrates defended the preservation of slaves, mm-hmm. not the, not preserving them, like keeping them alive, but just keeping them as slaves. Like, yeah. the, the secular morality that we're very familiar with is absolutely the, born from Protestant morality. Mm-hmm. Our, our public schools come from protestant schools Mm -hmm. and they just stopped talking about god but still still kept teaching all of the same things and then we started adding science and things just started getting even better (laughs) or worse depending on your perspective (laughs) or yeah i mean as science develops there seems to be a greater and greater divide between american christians and people who actually pay attention and understand science and are smart. <laughs> Ooh, shots fired. We're going to get some there, there are loads of American Christians who aren't stupid, but I feel like they're outnumbered by the ones who are. <laughs> yes. But everything that we call secular life is very tightly connected to what used to be the Protestant norm. Even the idea of keeping your religion private and not displayed out publicly was a protestant practice that is dying a little bit among evangelical communities for example but there's also political morality things that have a motivation of ruling people rather than of binding people together that's not terribly different but i guess not quite the focus of this discussion (laughs) another episode but is also incredibly complicated so it's It's definitely not fair to say, oh, you're an atheist. There's no way you could possibly be moral. That's nonsense. The Christian majority on this planet has done an excellent job of imposing good morals on people while also doing a terrible job of illustrating them on a regular basis. Or enforcing themselves. (laughs) Absolutely. Might be the... the... People have frequently proven that they are terrible at (laughs) self-government. Shopping carts. Right? Shopping carts are probably my favorite example. If you can't be trusted to put a shopping cart where it's supposed to be parked when you're done with it, where where do you think you belong in society? Put your shopping <laughs> carts back, people, if you're listening to this. Right? That's Put why that's why they implemented the stupid token throwing a quarter, throwing a dollar thing into the little push thing to unlock it. So that you have to put it back to get your dollar back. And people still don't do it. <laughs> It's so also a conversation in economics, which is not this podcast. But, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's loads of atheists who absolutely are good people. And Keep talking. Uh, there's actually a great story. Um, it's attributed to an old rabbi couple, almost a couple of thousand years ago who uh, was approached by a student. And he said, God created everything, right? And the rabbi's like, yeah, God created everything. He created the plants, the animals, the air that you breathe, everything that you need to live. And the kid's like, and and everything is good, right? The rabbi's like, well, yeah, it's all good. It's meant to be a blessing to everybody in the world. And the kid's like, well, what about atheists? <gasps> Which, I mean, sounds 
if you stop the story here, it's like, well, obviously there must be an exception to the rule. Atheists are terrible. All right. And I mean, their experience in first century, second century Mediterranean, atheists were almost always terrible to anybody who believed in God, called barbarians, even though actually a lot of barbarians were just enjoying a different theology. <laughs> Atheists were considered dangerous. Uh -huh. They didn't answer to anybody. Uh -huh. And so it's a very real concern for this little Jewish kid. And the rabbi has the best explanation ever. He says that atheists exist to make the faithful better. Oh, I like that. That like, warms <laughs> my little heart. Right? Atheist. But, but it, it's, it's even more complicated and deeper and more positive than that. That when something terrible happens, you have so many faithful, faithful air quotes, who will happily say, I will pray for you and hopefully God will help you. An atheist isn't going to say that. One, because it's a stupid thing to say. Mm -hmm. Even a properly faithful person should realize that that's a stupid thing to say. <laughs> and so the rabbi explains to the kid that an atheist isn't going to say, I'll pray for you and send you on your way. He's going to do what he can to help you because he knows no one else will. And so in a time of hardship, you should think to yourself, what would an atheist do? An atheist is going to help. And so as a faithful person, the rabbi says to the child, you should pray that God will help, but then get off your ass and do something about it. They said ass in the first century. I'm paraphrasing I a whole so. lot. <laughs> I don't have this text in front of me. It's, it's cool to read the story yeah. the way it's written, but I am paraphrasing a lot. <laughs> but... You've got, I haven't found any biblical translation that meets my criteria, but Paul absolutely said shit in oh. the New Testament. We just translate it into a softer language because we don't like to have people swearing in church all the time. <laughs> but so that, that idea that, that the rabbi teaches the kid about atheists, I think is really helpful. Okay. That there are loads of atheists with good morality and sometimes you have to pretend just for a moment that God isn't going to help. Mm -hmm. We'll do a full episode on atheism. <laughs> sure. Um, at some point, just like everything else. Yeah. Um, we can't leave that out. <laughs> no, well, we might lump it in. We're going to break down all, all the religions, the big ones, mm -hmm. um, in the coming weeks. So that we have a foundation to do the rest of our episodes off of. Um, maybe we'll throw it in there. Yeah. So back to that, the morality thing, and I, I think I'd mentioned it a little earlier, there's this idea that might is right. Mm -hmm. It's still popular today. Mm -hmm. You still see all over the place somebody who wants to argue with you, and they're willing to fight you physically to show that they're right, which makes no sense at all. Yeah. If somebody wants to beat me up because I think the world is a globe instead of a disc... There's no correlation between the two. I might lose that fight. That doesn't mean I'm wrong about the world being a globe. <laughs> yeah. But that is a method of establishing authority, which, again, religion is in a position where that's a lot of their history. <laughs> and magic, only a tiny little bit. And science... Not at all. That's not the basis of their authority at all. <laughs> no, it would be hilarious to have scientists punching people. And I'm sure some scientists want to punch people. Oh, absolutely. If you watch enough Bill Nye, you know he that he is fighting someone. the urge to be violent. <laughs> <laughs> not all the time, obviously, but definitely sometimes. Definitely. <laughs> sometimes. Uh, I, I watched part of a really intense debate between Bill Nye and some oh, theologian I just down pulled the States. That up. I pulled that up because I wanted to, we were sort of talking near it and I uh, yeah. didn't get to bring it up, but it was Bill Nye and Ken Ham yes. back in 2014. And, and neither of them got anywhere with the other guy. No, but <laughs> I remember Bill Nye saying that, I think it was one of the last questions. I don't know, but it really stood out to me. And... The moderator asked, what would change your mind? And Bill Nye said, proof. And Ken Ham said nothing. <laughs> nothing right? um, which so <laughs> I think, we're talking about, you know, evangelicals and, and objecting to science. Like, that Like that blows my mind, right? If, if Bill and I had proof that creationism was real, he'd be like, yeah, creationism's real. Mm -hmm. And to not budge, like, that 
like that keeps us in the dark ages. Right. And I think <laughs> long term that will hurt religion, whatever religion it is. You know, there are other religions that take firm stances like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think in the long term that will her religion as we learn more and as we I just as we become more aware of others. The religions that are gonna find the least conflict in the development of science are gonna be the ones who make no specific claims at all, which they exist. The idea of them growing while making no specific claims is bewildering. <laughs> It's, but I guess in some ways that's like, let's just sweep it under the rug and then every person can decide for themselves what they believe. Yeah. But yeah, ones that take firm stance on like science isn't real, that sounds so wrong to say, will <laughs> will shrink because... Science I've, is getting pretty strong. <laughs> well, it's getting strong and we're, you know, having some real world examples of, you know coronavirus Mm -hmm. on scientists are saying one thing we're ignoring them and people are getting sick and die well Um, you've got all these faith healers especially the big televangelists who make a show of these fancy healing miracles they're happy to do on their stage with actors they're not going to hospitals and healing people who are dying of coronavirus you've got some people who say well it's just god punishing people so of course i'm not gonna go in there and help them all right which is nonsense like that i don't know if you could come up with a more self-destructive evil position to hold then coronavirus is meant to be a punishment from god perfectly reasonable people who i don't think it's safe to say are the worst of sinners are dying well very terrible people are not (laughs) i don't know where my brain is going with this but did we explain the beginning of modern religion we talked around it a we lot. Talk, we did talk around it a little bit, didn't we? Like, but basically, there's... it was used to organize society. Yeah. It developed into more magical things. Then it got more organized and developed. A set of morals that we sort of still live by. But I'm a good person, even though I've never been to church. Yeah. Is my thesis statement. Yes. <laughs> your, your position of you can be moral without being religious is 100% correct. But... I am disinclined to believe that morality is going to pop up in a vacuum. Okay, I used that that sentence wrong. Morality is a nonsense word in itself without a qualifier. That's true. (laughs) And it's something we'll never know because there's always been some sort of religion guiding people. Absolutely. Um, And so it's almost like it's just a mental exercise. Yeah, I... (laughs) I'm thinking far too hard for a Sunday afternoon at this point. But (laughs) any last thoughts on... The golden rule is a wonderful thing. It's taught by almost every major religion. Mm -hmm. Well, it's taught by every major religion Mm -hmm. and most minor religions. Mm -hmm. The idea that if you don't want somebody to be a dickbag to you, maybe you shouldn't be a dickbag to them. (laughs) Well, and and that's, that's where I think morality could have developed if we and again it's sort of a ridiculous idea because there's always been some sort of deity mm-hmm. i think morality could have developed without religion because stuff sucks right like i said if you killed my husband i would be very upset and i would know how much it would hurt someone if i killed their husband or loved one or you know same with theft or but revenge and demands for justice are also pretty great <laughs> With strong arguments to support them, even. (laughs) Give me one. Well, say you kill my wife. Would it not be just for me to exact the same sort of suffering upon you? The the golden rule says don't do that, even though justice says, no, you totally deserve it. (laughs) Fair, and this then turns into an interesting offshoot of capital punishment. And right. religion, because often people in favor of capital punishment are religious. Usually. Usually. Uh, I mean, the Bible, the, the Torah, specifically says that capital punishment is appropriate. The, uh, the interesting thing about an eye for an eye is that it's really easy to look at it from our perspective where that's worse than what we have now. 
But when that was given as a law, it was actually far more generous than what was normal. I... Like, if you stab me in the eye, in Egyptian-era Israel, it was totally acceptable for me to kill you, mm -hmm. which is extreme, extreme escalation. And then it got moderated in the days of Moses, and it got moderated even further in the Christian era mm -hmm. by this idea that you need to be more merciful. You need to be better than your enemy. But I... Morally better rather can't than... go back <laughs> 2,000 plus years, but I imagine keeping society in line when you don't have modern day police forces and lawyers and judges. That's put the probably, fear of God in them. <laughs> well, put the fear of God in it. Yeah, fear of God in the fact that my eye's going to get stabbed out. Probably keeps people in line. And I mean, there's examples of countries like Singapore that have really high penalties. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go to a mall in Singapore and have money pouring out your purse and they'll still be there. I don't because know. You're because you're worried about your hand getting cut off. Because you're worried about your hand getting cut off. Yeah. So it's, Prob yeah, I mean, these are all just ways to moderate people's behaviors in society. And, I mean, the golden rule is probably the most humane. It's the one that's the easiest to understand. The reciprocal imperative is very straightforward. If I don't want to get hurt, don't, don't hurt, hurt somebody people, else. Yeah. It's the economics of self-preservation, but also it's a really good way to deal with the world around you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess an eye for an eye <laughs> is the golden rule. Just a little more gory. It's slightly more enforced. <laughs> yeah, right? But yeah, do unto others as you had done to you, I guess would be the... Yeah. This is a little more proactive. It one. is. And that is ultimately the intent of our new understanding of the golden rule versus the eye for an eye. It's, yeah, meant to reduce that violence rather than aggravate that's all for our first episode of the holy watermelon podcast if you like what you heard please subscribe and leave us a five-star review peace be with you it's cool. It's cool.